All right, good morning, church. Hey, I want you to grab your Bibles, and here's what I'm going to ask you to do before we even open them. I'm going to ask you to just hold them, and I'll tell you why in a second. You know, we are on week three of kind of a mini-sermon series before Easter. You know, usually I like to preach through just books of the Bible, and in between it, we kind of sandwich in some hot topics. We find ourselves on a mini-series, and here's what we're asking. We're really, the, the, the series is entitled, Watch What Happens, and we're really asking a question. What if, what if, as Christians and followers of Christ, we actually did those things that our God, our Lord and Savior, and the Bible instructs us to do. Just simple things. Probably the most, there's tons of things, but then there are really just simple things. What if we were to, you know, three weeks ago, just obey Jesus? There's two words. Obey Jesus' commission that he gave us. So 2,000 years ago, he gave us a great commission. What if we did that? We went into all the world and made disciples of Jesus, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that we've been commanded. You know what would happen? People get saved. <laughs> that's, what, that's what would happen. Last week, we, we looked at another simple command that we've been given by God and reaffirmed absolutely with Jesus. What if we loved people like the Bible calls us to love people? There's no loopholes with that, by the way. That's what we learned last week. You know, the way that the world ought to know that we're real disciples, Jesus says, is that we love one another. So, we struggle with that sometimes, loving one another in the church, but then we see Jesus who says that we ought to love our neighbor. We're supposed to love our enemy. That kind of covers all human beings. What if we did that? You know what would happen? The world would see us as radically different. They would see us as not hate-filled and not divisive, and that's different than everything else in the world, and they would want to hear this gospel that we proclaim. Well, here's what we're going to talk about with this last week, a simple thing. What if... We actually, instead of just having Bibles and sometimes reading them, what if we actually, as followers of Jesus Christ, we lived the Word? Like we actually lived it. The words and the pages of our God breathed out to us, we put it into action every day. That's what we want to look at this morning. Simple things I think we take for granted. And here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I want you to just grab your Bible and hold it, even if it's on your phone. Hold your phone. That holds all those different translations of the Bible. We are going to open it in a second, but here's the thing. I want to talk about the Bible first. I think we are so familiar in the United States of America with the Bible, we absolutely take it for granted. We forget what it is really. We forget that this collection of writing, this scripture that we hold is, and this is an understatement, incredibly different than every other kind of written text. Amen. It's just totally different. And I think that if we were to remember how unique and different it is, it would change the way that we approach it and how often we approach the word. I want to just talk about the word for a second before we open it. It is uniquely different in so many ways. This book, as we call it, collection of books, is the best-selling book of all time. You know, you might go, we've talked about this before, you might go to Google and type in best-selling book and something else might come up. I don't know what that would be. You know, Purpose Driven Life, Harry Potter, I don't know, something like that. But there's always going to be a little asterisk by it. And that asterisk means this might be the number one book with the exception of the Bible, which is by far the best-selling book of all time. It's incredible. There are 50 Bibles being sold every minute in this country. There is a Bible, think about this, for all the billions of people that exist on the planet, there is a copy of the Bible, enough copies for every single person on the planet. I mean, 30 years ago, the, the Bible Society said that in order to keep up with the demand for the Bible, they had to publish every three seconds a Bible night and day for 24 hours. I mean, it's unbelievable. I don't know of many texts or books or whatever you can go buy from Amazon that are kind of jumping off the shelves like that. Not only is it the most bought book, it's the most shoplifted book of all time. More people steal the Bible than any other book. That's crazy talk. It's one of those things I always think about. I'm sure it puts like book owners and stores in like a dilemma. Like, should you get mad about that? They probably need the Bible. I mean, if they're stealing it, should we have it? have the Bible. You need it, obviously. It's the most translated book in all the world. I mean, I started losing track. How many languages that have at least a portion of the Bible? Last time I checked, it was like 2,023 languages and dialects that this has been translated into. It's incredible. I mean, go to your user version app on the, the Bible and just start thumbing through all the different translations. It's incredible. It's the first book ever printed on a printing press. We just go on and on and on. You got... You got fact that you got 66 books from 40 different authors 
over a 1600 year period combined all in this text we call the Bible and here's an understatement it is different I think about a quote even from a professor Montiero Williams who was a Bowdoin professor of Sanskrit and here's what he did he spent 42 years exactly the length that I've been on the planet this man spent studying not just the Bible but just sacred texts of the east and he says you know what I've discovered after 42 years this text different than even the sacred text forget Harry Potter or whatever else you, you might read this is different than, than the Iliad and the Odyssey and Moby Dick and, and Huck Finn it's different than all those books but it's different than all the sacred texts he says you know what if you ought to do is take all the sacred texts you can find and put it on the table stack them up over here on the left side take your copy of the Bible and put it as far away on the table as you can on this side he says there is an absolute gulf of difference between all of those and the word of God Amen. I think we don't realize that we, we lose our Bibles we leave from church throw them up on the dashboard of the car and then get them next week have to, I, we have a Bible or two left in church every week nobody ever comes back for them brand new still got the, the gold flake on the side if it didn't have names on it I'd just give it away for Christmas gifts or something you know <laughs> it's unique Look at, think about that. Just what I said before. It's written over a 1,500 year span of time. 40 different generations. Written from 40 different authors from all kinds of walks of life. You've got kings, peasants, philosophers, fishermen, poets, statesmen, scholars, prime ministers, cupbearers, kings, tax collectors, Pharisees. Written in different moods. You've got, you've got mo, I mean, uh, different moods. You've got David writing in times of war. You've got Solomon writing in times of peace. You've got different places. Moses is writing in the wilderness, Jeremiah in the dungeon, Daniel uh, on a hillside in a palace, Paul in prison, John exiled on the Isle of Patmos. It's written in three different continents, Asia, Africa, Europe, in three different languages, Aramaic, Hebrew, Greek. And here's one of the fascinating things is that this book and collection is filled with what we would call, the world would call controversial topics. It is. And yet somehow over a 1,640 generation time span with people who never met each other on different continents who did different things, different walks of life, somehow they were able to manage from Genesis to Revelation to have a, a message that's exactly the same. Amen. Weaved together with the thread of the glory of God and God's plan for redemption from Genesis to the maps in the back of your Bible. How does that happen? We're going to get to that. I read a book by Josh McDowell. He says, yeah, we could go all day on what makes this unique. Yes, it's unique in its continuity. It's unique in the fact that it's still here. Thousands of years that the Bible still exists is unbelievable in some ways. It was written down on things that would have wasted away. I mean, papyrus, parchment, vellum, ostraca, which was pottery, clay tablets, wax tablets, but it was preserved like no other book. I mean, you had the Jews who had scribes and they had Masoretes whose whole job was to not just write it down, but they were to preserve it. Every letter, every character, every word, they counted them. Let me tell you what, people aren't counting the Iliad and the Odyssey. They're not doing it. My newest High Republic Star Wars book, no, nobody's translating it with that kind of scrutiny. They're not doing it. The fact that it survived just over time is incredible. The fact that it survived over time with persecution. Let me tell you what, if there was ever a book that the world wanted to get rid of, this is it. And yet here it is. I mean, if anything else, it would just be one of those times where you're just, Jesus' prophecy is coming true. In Matthew 5, 18, he said that. For truly I say to you that heaven and earth will pass away, but not an iota or a dot will pass away from the law until it is all accomplished. He got that right. Amen. It's never going away. They can try to. They can try to cancel it. Not going anywhere. Amen. The content of the Bible, unique, different than every other book. It's fascinating. Even just history, even if people don't believe it's the word of God, one of the things awesome about this as opposed to other sacred texts are it's incredibly historic. I mean, incredibly historic. You can find the places in here. Very detailed. It's not always like that with other sacred books. You can read those names and think, I don't know who these people are. We don't have any account of that. That's, that's not what we see in here. I think about the prophecy in the Bible, unbelievably unique, miraculous. There's over some 2,500 different prophecies in the Bible. You have hundreds to thousands of messianic prophecies. And when I say it's unbelievable, here's what I mean by that. 
Not that there's hundreds of prophecies that have come true, but the fact that eight, I remember reading somebody one time who said, look, the probability that eight, just take eight of them, prophecies about Jesus would come true in the person of Jesus Christ is one in 10 to the 17th power. Okay, that's 10 with 17 zeros behind it. I don't even know what that number is. I don't even know how to say that. I heard somebody say, just to help you visualize how incredibly improbable it is that all these prophecies could come true just in one person it was like they said you could take the state of texas cover it two feet deep in silver coins take one coin paint it red blindfold a person leave them to wander over the state of texas and give them one chance to lean over and grab that one red coin that would be the probability just by accident and sheer chance that those prophecies eight of them would be fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ the Bible is chock full of these prophecies and not one of them has not come true I mean we could just go all day I could go all day before we even open it I think sometimes we don't even think about those things when we open this we just use it to prop up the wobbly leg sometimes at the table and here's what I want to say as we open the word now. I want you to go ahead and grab your Bibles and open up 2 Timothy chapter 3. None of those things are what make the Bible most compelling, most unique, and utterly different than everything else. None of those things. I mean, I ask the question, what is it that would make this the best-selling book? I mean, is it that much of a page turner? Are there people like it's spring break week? Let's go out there and hang out on the hammock under the tree and just read this from cover to cover? I don't think so. You might get through Genesis and then maybe through Exodus, but then you, you hit Leviticus, you're like, Phew, I'm going to have to go take a break. If you make it through Leviticus, you get to Numbers and you're like, I didn't even know we were doing math in the Bible. This is crazy. What in the world would make it this popular? We find our answer in 2 Timothy. I want you to see this. The most compelling reason, what makes it utterly different than everything else we see right here in 2 Timothy 3, starting in verse 16. And right in the first couple of words, it says this. All Scripture is, listen to this. There ain't no book like this. All Scripture is breathed out by God. I mean, I don't care what book you go get on Amazon. It might be compelling, and it might be inspirational, and it might be good and entertaining, and might be instructional for your life, but let me tell you what, there is only one only one collection that is the word of god this is important breathed out the sovereign creator of the universe has given you his word written down to you we probably need to think about that more when we open it it ought to if we thought about that more it would cause us to open it more think about it more and it wasn't like men were writing it oh by the way thinking this is probably what God would say. I want you to just listen to this. Don't worry about flipping there. 2 Peter 1, 20-21 says that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You know what it means? That even the men who penned this took their pen and they weren't like, you know, I think God would say this. No, the Holy Spirit carrying them along as they wrote it. That's unbelievable. And we could just go all day. This is, there's nothing like this. I think about Hebrews 4, 12 through 13, that says, For the word of God is what? Living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and spirit of joints and of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed in the eyes of him whom, with whom we give an account. You know what he's talking about there? This mysterious author of Hebrews? He's referring to this divine revelation that we find in two places in scripture and in the incarnate being of Jesus in the flesh I think it's so important because a lot of people would read Hebrews 4 and be like well that's talking about Jesus it's talking about Jesus in the word number one you, you can't have one without the other for all those people who are like, what do I need to read the Bible for? I already know Jesus. Number one, they're inexplicably linked together. All that we know of the Son of God as the Son of God and everything that He's accomplished, we know, let me tell you how we know, because of the truth of not hearsay. We know it because the truth of God's revelation given to us in His Word. Amen. I mean, the reason why I would not dot our iota has passed away until it was accomplished, this is how we know. You hadn't met Jesus face to face. I haven't. I will. God revealed it to us in his word in the person of Jesus Christ as well. It's living and it's active. Why? Because the one who scripture belongs to is not a dead God, but a living God. 
Now here's the question. Let's get to the practical meat because that's what I wanted these three weeks to be. Let's answer the question we set out to answer now that we know what we're dealing with here with the word. What if, what would happen if we actually did a couple things, really one thing. What if we opened it more than we do now and read it and when we read it, we heard it and when we heard it, we understood it and here's the question. What if then once we knew it and nourished ourselves on it, we actually put that into action in our living rooms, in our workplaces, in our own lives? What if we lived the Word? Some of you might be confused. I think some people would hear that and be like, Brad, I don't understand what you're saying. We all have it. That's what you just made a case for. There's a copy for everybody. I think probably have more than one copy. If your house is anything like mine, you, you probably got 10 at least. We ought to have a game. I could have quizzed. Who has the most Bibles at their house? I mean, there's, you probably got three or four different translations, children's Bibles, camo Bibles, comic Bibles, kids' Bibles. They probably have LSU Bible. I don't have an LSU Bible, but I bet they have an LSU Bible. That'd be cool with a purple and gold cover on it. Royalty colors. That's good. That'd be good. If you're looking for a Christmas gift for me, that'd be awesome. I would really love that. LSU Bible. You might be saying, what's the problem? We all have the Bible. The problem is, is not having it. The problem is not being near it. The problem is living it, reading it, understanding it, knowing it, being nourished on it. I mean, I read a study nine years ago, so I'm sure these numbers are worse in 2012, here's what we see. We see this. A survey of 2,900 Protestant churchgoers were asked a couple questions. The first question, how often do you read the Bible? How often do you take it out? God's Word revealed to you in written form, the sovereign creator of the universe. How often do you open it and actually read it? Forget living it. 19% said every day. That means 81% of all churchgoers would say, I don't open it every day. There's days that go by, and I have the words of God, the creator of the universe, and I just don't even read it. I mean, I would imagine if you were to ask those same people, how many times do you go through your day and not check your email? Never. But the Word of God, yeah, pff, I don't need it every day. Ask other people, how, how many times? 26% said a few times a week. 14%, I think this was interesting because I did do an update stat on this one. 14% said once a week. That number has actually dropped. That number, once a weekers, has been 13 and a half to 14 and a half for 20 years. This year, it went down to 8.5%. Let me tell you why. Because the one time a week po folks were opening their Bibles when they were in church. And it's shown me that people during COVID have abandoned church. And therefore, their one time of opening the Bible, it's over as well. Eight and a half. 22% said at least once a month. And 18%, so nearly 20% of people that go to church, said they never, ever open their Bibles. Now, what's interesting is the same people were asked another question would say, do you agree or disagree with this statement? I desire to please and honor Jesus in all that I do. 90% of the same people said yes. So I want to do what Jesus wants me to do, and I have a desire to do that, and I should do it. I just want to try to do that apart from knowing what it is that God's calling me to do and how it's accomplished. And we wonder why there's disobedience and why we have Christians who are living in frustration. They're trying to live out what they think God wants them to do without knowing his word, and without any real faith, because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ, Romans 10, 17, why they have a frustrated life, why they're given into sin, why they keep stumbling with the same things, and the sin that so easily entangles. And, and here's what I would say. I think there are people who have uh, unattached their walk with Christ from the word of God, and they would say, well, I still pray, and I would say, you know what, that's good. It's good that you talk to God, but do you listen to his word? You say, it's good that you pray, but do you read his word? It's good that you go to church. That's awesome, but do you practice what's preached in church? It's good that you know about Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Maybe you ask another question. What's the big deal? Why is that such a big deal? Why a whole sermon on living the word? I'm going to heaven. <laughs> I know Jesus, so I'm not going to hell. What's the big deal? Let me tell you what the big deal is. Because if we are going to be who God has called us to be as followers of Christ and disciples, and I'm, I'm preaching to me. I hope y'all listen to me. All I'm doing up here is preaching to me, and I'm hoping y'all are listening to me preach to me. If we are ever going to be who we're called to be and do what we're called to do, that is only ever going to happen if we are people of the Word and we know the Word. 
And I just want you to know that this is not just my opinion. This is what the Bible says. Jesus said it like this. Listen to Jesus' words in Matthew 16, 24. Jesus says this. He told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, right there, follower of disciple, you're coming after Jesus, that's a disciple. If you would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. What did Jesus mean by follow me? So if a disciple is somebody who follows Jesus, was he literally talking to these first century disciples and saying, all you gotta do to be a disciple of mine is literally follow me around? So just wherever I walk, you walk. That's not what he was talking about. We can't do that today. I don't have Jesus here and he's like, hey, I'm headed to D.C. And I'm like, well, let me get in the car. I'll follow you. What was he talking about? When he says follow, does it mean for a disciple to follow Jesus? It means this. I want you to write this down because it seems simple, but we forget it. It means obedience. Action. Obeying. I mean, Jesus said, John 14, 15, those who love me, it's not that they have loving feelings or they have fuzzy wuzzies. No, Jesus says, those who love me will keep. You may have a version of the Bible that says obey. Those who love me will obey my commands. If you don't know the commands, you don't know the word of the Lord, not only will you have puny faith, you have no chance of obeying. Following Christ means obedience. I mean, a Christian who is not obeying Christ's commands, I think could rightly be asked the question that Jesus asks of people when he asked it in Luke chapter 6. Listen to this. Jesus asks this question. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Here's what Jesus is saying. Why would you call me Lord? I mean, you could call me friend. You could call me a chum. You could call me a fellow resident and all those things and not obey me and be fine but you can't call me lord master and king and tell me no or, or later or wait on it i mean there's only one appropriate answer for a master there's only one appropriate answer for a king there's only one appropriate answer for a lord and here's what it is yes i mean we wouldn't say that to our boss and stay around long we don't usually say those to our parents and not get a spanking. Jesus says this. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? He says, everyone who comes to me and hears my words and does them, I will show you what it's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose and the stream broke against the house and could not shake it because it had been built well. But the one who hears and does not do them, no activity, it's like a man who built his house on the ground without a foundation. When the stream broke against it, immediately it fell, and the ruin of the house was great. You know what he's saying is that people who would claim to be followers of Christ don't do the words that Christ spoke. They may not have a foundation in Jesus. They may just be posers and fakers and hypocrites. James says this very thing. I want you to grab your Bibles. I want you to open up James chapter 1. This is where we're going to spend the rest of our time. James chapter 1, I want you to look with me in verse 19. James is Jesus' half-brother. So here was a guy who at one point, before a resurrected Jesus came about, thought Jesus maybe was crazy. And there was a couple times where like, we're going to have to go get Jesus. He's going to get himself killed. He's making some crazy claims. And then how did that change? Where do we get to this James who's writing about the resurrected Savior? Because you know what? He saw Jesus dead, and then he saw Jesus alive <laughs> with his own eyes. I mean, the Easter happened, and he's like, whoop, nope, he is exactly who he said he was. So much so, he believed that he was willing to give his life for that. So the James who wrote this was the one who had his head beaten in with a club until he died for believing in Jesus as the Messiah. This is his half-brother, and he's talking about this very thing. G James is preaching the sermon that I'm preaching right now. Listen to what he says in verse 19. He says this, Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And then listen to this, but be doers of the word, it's so interesting he said doers. He didn't say uh, experts of the word. He didn't say be people who could win Bible trivia of the word. He didn't say people who could just read it fast or memorize it the best. No, I think the important thing he focused on here, very active word. He says here's what we ought to be with this implanted word. Doers of it. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. So hearing is good, but that's not it. I mean, it, if you're ever going to be a doer of the word, hearing it is probably a good thing, but not hearers only. Hearers only. 
deceiving yourselves. I want you to do something. If you don't mind underlining and writing your Bible, underline those two words. They're important. Deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Let me tell you what James is saying. And let me just preface this with, you you may not like this, so a little warning right here. This this might be hard for some of you to hear, and I'll just say, you could be mad. Just get mad at James. It's not me, okay? Here's what James says, especially in the United States of America, because all of us in this room, I will take a safe bet we've all been exposed to the Word of God. We've come into contact with it. If you've gone to any hotel and opened the drawer, boom, Word of God, there you are. You've heard Jesus' name. And there's only two categories for how we respond to this word. Two categories, James says. And that means everybody in this room right now and everybody watching online, you fall into one of two categories. You are either a hearer only of the word or you're a doer of the word. And so that's a question you need to answer for yourself. Which one are you? How do you know which one you are? Well, James tries to unpack that for us. James says, let me talk about hearers of the word. Here's what they are. And this is the part people don't like, but just hang with me. James says hearers of the words are liars. And he said the word deceiver, but he, he said liar. And they're the worst kind of liars. You know why? Because they're lying to themselves. Hearers are those people who would say, I, with their mouth, they would say, I know the word, I've heard the word. I tell people I'm a follower of Christ. I slap the sticker on the back of my car. I wear the t-shirt. I'm just not going to go do it. I'm not going to go live it. I'm not going to go be obedient to it. No. I'm going to stand over here on the sideline and turn my walk with Jesus into what the Bible doesn't describe. I'm going to turn it into a spectator sport where I just sit on the side like it's an opera and golf clap. I'm like, oh, that's awesome, Jesus. Good job. And all these other people should be doing what Jesus says. I mean, I'm not going to do it, but... And they think, number one, that that's real faith because, you know, the the Bible makes it clear that real faith is accompanied by real deeds. So that tells me that if there's not deeds, it's very likely that somebody could have a fake, disingenuous faith. You might want to ask that question. How does that happen? James says, you know how it happens? You know how people are hearers only of the word? Oh, by the way, let me just say something. The walk with Jesus Christ, we've already covered this. It is anything but a spectator sport. I mean, Paul made that clear. Paul talks about it being a race, a marathon, a boxing match, training. God's not calling us to be over here spectators of fans of Jesus. No, 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 no. We're not fans, golf clapping. We're followers. We get off the bench and say, it's time to check into the game. That's what we do. Time to get in. I gotta go live this. That's what he's calling for. Those who love me aren't the ones who admire me from afar. No, they're following my commands. They're in the game. But here's what he says. How is that possible? He, he gives us an analogy. He says the word of God for those hearers only is like a mirror. And the first century mirror was kind of like a big polished spoon, metal. And they, they're the kind of people who might look intently into it. They may study it, but here's the word that they use. That word look in verse 23 in the Greek is the word that means glance. They only glance at it. Spend a little bit of time in front of it. They take the mirror of God's word and their hearers only are the kind of people who just kind of look at it real quick. And let me tell you what, they can't. When you only glance at it once a week, once a month, every so often, there's no way you can remind yourself of who you are. You forget. The world that you live in every single day when you're not in front of the mirror, oh, it's gonna try to tell you who you are. It's gonna lie to you and tell you your identity is your gender, your identity is uh, your sexual preference. It's gonna tell you that your your identity is how much money you have in the bank account. Your identity is your self-worth and what you look like and your career and your status. And all of that's garbage. It's not true of you, but you don't know that. Why? Because you're not living in front of the mirror of the word. You don't know who you are. You don't know that it's no longer you who live. It's Christ who lives in you. You don't know those promises because you're only in front of the word a little bit you don't know anything else that's clear you're not in front of the word I love it he says the difference between a hearer only is the how long they look and the way that they look in front of the mirror of the word time in front of it by the time you get to verse 25 look at what verse 25 says about a doer of the word it says this but the one who looks different Greek word it's why Greek is important that Greek word for look in 23 different than the Greek word in 25 
The Greek word for look in verse 23 means glance. The, the one that we find in verse 25 means to examine, study, intent, look at it. And not only look at it intent, he says, not only the one who looks at the law of liberty, but the one who perseveres. You know what it means? They keep doing it over and over and over. Rinse, lather, repeat. They're living in the word of God, feasting on the word of God. They're not hungry. They not only know who they are, but they know everything else is well. This is what we see in Scripture. People that live in front of the mirror of the Word, let me, just, let me just end with this. Not only will they see themselves correctly, but they will see everything else correctly as well. Amen. I love it. C.S. Lewis, one of his most famous quotes, he says, I believe in Christianity because, or he said, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see the sun, but because I see everything else. The Word of God ought to be our perspective. The Word of God ought to be our worldview. The Word of God ought to be our, uh, well, it ought to be what Psalm 119 says, a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path. It ought to be a flashlight that we pull out and say, you know what, I gotta make decisions in this life. I gotta go and live. I gotta go and do. How do I make sure I don't keep bumping into things, keep falling into holes of old sin? How do I know where God wants me to go? Pull out the flashlight of His Word like Psalm 119 says. It'll be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. And the point of having a lamp unto your feet, feet and a light unto your path is so you can walk. So you can walk in the Lord. It ought to be a lens in which we view everything else in the world. How you raise your kids, how you spend your money, how you vote, how you treat your neighbor. It ought to all be influenced through the lens of the truth of God's word. And let me tell you what, lenses are important. They're powerful things. How you interpret all of reality around you depends on the way you see things. If something is wrong in your seeing and something's wrong with your lenses, guess what? You're not going to be able to see what's real. You might only see what's a... If your lens is distorted and false, you might see a distorted and a perverted view of the world around you. perspective in our lens will affect every decision in everything we do and let me tell you what that's true physically and it's true spiritually i mean even jesus said that luke 11 34 through 35 he says your eye is a lamp of your body when your eye is healthy your whole body is full of light but when it is bad your body is full of darkness therefore be careful lest the light of light in you be darkness that's why the psalmist in psalm 119 prayed this open my eyes that i may behold i may see wondrous things out of your law how is it and this is where we get to and we end how is it that we've got followers of christ how do we have followers of christ who don't who claim to follow christ and don't and that's that's my question how do we get to a place where we have people who Call Jesus Master and Lord and Savior, but don't obey Him. I think it could be a couple of things. One, maybe they don't know Him, really, as their Lord and Savior. Two, maybe they have forgotten Him and that they have put on different lenses than the Word of God. I mean, maybe like Ephesians 1 says, they've at one time really knew Jesus. They've had the eyes of their hearts enlightened that they can know the hope in which we've been called the richest, glorious inheritance in the saints, but you know what? Over time, they have just not spent time in the Word, not in the truth, and therefore the Word is not the lens that they're living on. It's something else. I give you this just because it's the picture in my head. Maybe we've got Christians. We've got people that are so-called followers of Christ and they put on lenses of sin. And the only thing they can see is darkness. It's not who they are. It's not the truth. It's not reality. And let me just tell you what sin is. Let me give you another word for it because where every sin, I think, finds its root is selfishness. So the lens in which they see the world. When you're not in the word, let me tell you what you will inevitably see the world as through the eyes of selfishness. It's all about you. You see, my identity in Christ, when I understand the word, is my, it reminds me I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. I read the word and it's I must decrease, he must increase. The less time I'm in the word, let me tell you what will happen with your sinful desires and flesh, it will only think about itself. It gets real dark. Sinful. Start to affect things. It'll start to affect the way that you treat your neighbor. Guess what? You're not gonna treat your neighbor with much consideration because you don't have a lot of thoughts for anybody outside of yourself. Certainly not going to treat your enemy with consideration. 
It'll affect what you do with your money because you're probably going to build your kingdom here on earth. It'll affect how you vote, how you raise your kids, how much time you spend with your kids. I ain't got time for my kids. I got to build my kingdom and success. How I interact in society and communicate with other people might be more loud, might be more boisterous, might be more prideful. I might slander others and degrade others and embarrass others. You know what? it'll, It'll cause you to start using words like preference, my preference a lot more. Cause you to start using words like, I'm really concerned for my comfort. That's what sin and selfishness will do. Can I help you understand something? God is not primarily concerned. This might just burst your bubble. He's not really primarily concerned with our comfort here. He said salvation comes through affliction. I, mean, I think this is, if there's ever been a time where this has been evidence, it's been evidenced pre COVID and during COVID. I've heard more Christians in the midst of a global pandemic talk about not getting what they want at, at a church service. I'm thinking we're in the middle of a pandemic. Not only is it reek of a vision and perspective of selfishness, it, it reeks embarrassment, is what I would say. You know what I can think of when that happens? I think of a church in Debeshe, Haiti that I used to go to every year, our church plan in Debeshe, Haiti, where people, in order to attend church with no air conditioning and metal sided walls, had to walk on Saturday all day and sleep outside so they could be at church on Sunday morning. And no padded pews. I mean, they're not worried about registering or masks or checking in or sitting next to people. They're just worried about getting there on time. I think about being in Guatemala when I backpacked up to see these Kekchi Indians in the mountains of Guatemala. And we backpacked to show them a cheesy Jesus film on a sheet in a mahogany bark sided shed with dirt floors. And I remember in the middle of that film thinking this is the cheesiest thing ever and it's hot and we're sitting on dirt and we packed as many people as you could possibly pack in that room. And then I remember looking at all the cracks inside of the walls and guess what I saw? In every single crack for two and a half hours I saw the glow of eyeballs who couldn't get in the building so they stood outside and looked through the crack of the wall on a stump for two and a half hours and we complained about the things that we complain about sometimes. The music didn't fit my preferences. The air conditioner was too hot. I think about being in Lebanon a couple years ago and in the mountain uh, outside of Beirut and meeting with other Christians at like midnight in the dark in an apartment where I didn't have a seat because there were so many of them jammed in there. I was sitting next to the door and they're meeting at that time in that place because if we were to do that in the daytime, they could be killed, beaten up, or fired from their jobs. That's what a lens of selfishness will cause us to do. It's embarrassing. I think there are other lenses that we put on. We could keep going all day. I think sometimes Christians wear lenses like these. I'm glad you laughed because this is why I picked these glasses because they're goofy. I would never want to wear these out in public, although I'm wearing them now in front of everybody watching on YouTube and it's recorded. I can't imagine. I'm not trying to insult you. If you like these and you would wear these, I would never wear these. I couldn't take a person serious. I don't know if I could have a conversation with a person if they were wearing glasses like this. Apparently, somebody thinks it's awesome. Half of what's out there today, I look at it, I'm like, I couldn't wear that. I can't, just can't. What's in style? I've shifted over to being old now. I don't know. I'm complaining about the youngsters. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I pick these because they're bizarre and they're weird. And you know what? I, I call these the worldly lenses. I mean, that's the best way to describe the world now. I look at the news, I look at the world, and I think this is bizarre and backwards and weird and off. And sadly, I think there's a lot of Christians who like to put these lenses on. The way that they interpret their world and raise their kids and make decisions in life is based upon the culture. They want to know what to do about something. You know what they do? They put the lenses on of Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and their friends and their favorite news commentator as opposed to going to the Word of God. And then they wonder why things are backwards and everything's watered down and their faith is limp and weak and neutered. And they don't see a real life change because the culture can't do that. People go to Twitter and social media first to form their convictions in life. Huh. It's like a whole bunch of people who are spiritually emaciated go into other spiritually emaciated people to try to feed them and wonder why they're still hungry. How do you know if that's you? I can give you a couple. We could, I, I got to move on, but you know, I, th- I thought of it. You know, maybe you want to know whether that you have worldly lenses. When there's a natural disaster, a global pandemic, some conspiracy in the world hits the news. Let me ask you a quick question. This may not be 100% accurate all the time, but I think it's a good diagnostic question. Where do you run to first in response? 
You open up your laptop, be like, I gotta find out what's happening in the news today. Pick, 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 pick. When you wake up in the morning, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, your friends, your own thoughts. If you run there first, I'm not saying always, but I'm saying if that's the pattern in the habit of your life, you very likely are wearing lenses and your worldview is more informed by culture than it is the Word of God. So I, I feel like that's fair. Maybe, just maybe, we distract ourselves with worthless things. And the danger of that is that we take our eyes off of the author and perfecter and finisher of our faith, Jesus. What would happen? Friends, what would happen? What would happen if we read the word, knew the word, lived the word? You know, it would be like taking corrective lenses, clear lenses, these are a little foggy, but corrective lenses, protective lenses, and put on the word of God. It would help us see things clearly. It would help us see the world as we should see the world. It would help us see us the way that we're supposed to be. If you want to be obedient, then here's what I would say today. Resolve to do two things as we end our time. Two things I want to resolve that we need to do. You would think, well, maybe I'm just not in the Word. Maybe I'm a one time a week or a one time a month or I need to be in the Word more in order for me to live it out. Yeah, I actually think that's half the battle. I actually think if you've got this pair of glasses on or another pair of glasses on, let me tell you what, you can't just put on more of the word because that don't work either. This, this don't do it. You can't have selfishness and read the word and think, you know, I'm going to read the word, but I still want to have everything the way I want to have it. It involves two things. Maybe today you need to go home and find some worthless things that are in your life and vision that's skewed and you need to take these off repentant, that's what this is, repentance, and, and then put on the word. Off, on. It's kind of like losing weight. You're out, of, you're out of shape, you need to lose some weight, you need to take bad food out of your life, put good food in. Take out bad activities, put in good activities. I mean, this is biblical. I think of the psalmist. The psalmist would say in Psalm 103, 1, I will, I will not set before. It's like a psalmist who resolved something. I will not set before my eyes anything that's worthless. Maybe today, you need to right now go before the Lord in these next couple moments when we have a chance to respond and say, you know what, I need to resolve today that I need to take some worthless things out in front of my face. Maybe things for others, it may not be a problem, but maybe for you, it's like, you know what, I got a screen in front of my face nonstop, and that's shaping my worldview more than the Word of God. I need to put that to the side. I need to fast from screens for a while. You might need to deactivate some social media accounts. I would tell you, take it from somebody who did that a decade ago, is a wonderful thing. Never looked back, glorious. I used to get on there all the time, and every time I got off, I was more discouraged, more disappointed, and I'm like, why do I need that? I don't need that deactivate, beep, beep, it was awesome. Maybe you need to go rearrange the furniture in your living room. I had a professor one time that says, why do we set our living rooms up to the God of the TV? We don't even set our furniture up so that we can talk to one another. All the furniture's pointed to the TV. We don't even talk. Maybe you do as Psalm, Psalm 119, 37 says, turn your eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. I think about this. It's important because Charles Spurgeon says there is this tendency of things that are gazed at. It gets into our eyes, but it also gets into our mind and our hearts. I heard Tony Rankin, author, said this, worthless things in the eye gazed at become worthless things lodged in the heart. Our precious attention gets used for futile ends. Let me tell you what you're good at and I'm good at being distracted. I only got so much time to put things in front of my eyes, and if the Word of God's going to be 10th on the list, I don't have a chance. You know what we ought to do? Today, we would resolve to take those worthless things out, and then two, we would resolve to abide in His Word, like John 15 says. I will abide in you if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. And what would it do? Let me tell you what it would do. It would produce fruit in your life, and that fruit would cause you to do and be obedient.